Good evening, everybody, and welcome to this virtual presentation uh, by the Albright Knox uh, in conversation with Palo Light Lab this evening. My name is Dr. Tina Rivers Ryan, and I'm a curator here at the Albright Knox. And along with Paul Venus, I co curated the exhibition Difference Machines Technology and Identity in Contemporary Art, which is currently on view at Albright Knox Northland and is up for just another two weekends. We closed January 16th. Um, and so we're very pleased to present this conversation this evening as part of the public programming for that exhibition. Um, so, very quickly, just to introduce, um, you to Difference Machines, in case you haven't had a chance to see the exhibition yet. Uh, this is a show that is essentially about digital technology and its impact on how we understand identity, um, our own identity, and also the identities of each other. Um, it is featuring 17 artists, uh, 19 works of art are on view, um, and these range from videos to interactive games, to photographs, to 3D printed sculptures, uh, to websites and software programs, and uh, the works have all been made since the 1990s up until the present. So we hope you get a chance to see the exhibition. If not, you can check out our online resources. We have a really robust website that includes uh, video interviews with many of the artists, uh, installation photos, links to learn more about each artist, uh, videos, essays, uh, interviews. So we really hope um, that everyone enjoys the exhibition. Um, now, we thought it would be really wonderful uh, as part of the programming for this exhibition to bring in Pela Light Lab to talk to us. And for those of you who are not familiar with Pela Light Lab, you're about to learn a lot more about it. Um, it is a group based here in Buffalo at the University at Buffalo um, out of the Department of Media Study. And just a really brief background for those of you who are not familiar with Buffalo's history um, or who are tuning in from, from elsewhere, uh, Buffalo actually is uh, one of the most important sites for media art in America, or even globally. Back in the 1970s, the very first academic department devoted to the study of media was formed at the University at Buffalo. And it was a real hotbed of activity. Uh, it was host to uh, many, many artists who were faculty there, including uh, avant-garde filmmakers and early video art pioneers. Um, and so uh, it, it really has been um, sort of, uh, it was one of the main reasons that I wanted to, to move to Buffalo actually was this incredible legacy of media art here um, in the city. Um, and so Pala Light Lab continues that tradition um, and pushes it forward into the 21st century. So um, our speakers tonight will be uh, Dr. Margaret Ree and Dr. Cody Neer. Uh, Margaret Ree is a poet, scholar, and new media artist. Her debut poetry collection, Love Robot, was published in 2017 and awarded the Elgin Award by the Science Fiction Poetry Association and the Best Book Prize in Poetry by the Association of Asian American Studies. She has published widely in academic publications such as Cinema Journal, Amerasia Journal, and the Barnard Scholar Feminist Online. Her new media project, The Kimchi Poetry Machine, is exhibited at the Electronic Literature Collection, Volume 3. Previous teaching appointments before coming here to Buffalo include UCLA, Harvard University, and the University of Oregon. Currently, she's an assistant professor in media study at the University of Buffalo SUNY and co-leads the Pala Light Lab, which fosters poetry, participation, and pedagogy through technology and equity. Our next speaker will be Dr. Cody Meir, who is an assistant professor of game studies in the Department of Media Study at the University of Buffalo SUNY. They have published on games pedagogy, gender and queerness in games, and video game narratives and player experiences. And they are currently the game director for a project called Trans Folks Walking, a narrative game about trans experiences. They are co-director of the Pay the Light Lab at UB and work with the LGBTQ Video Game Archive on preserving and visualizing LGBTQ representation. Cody is directing Omatrix, I had to check the pronunciation, Omatrix Gaming Lab and Studio, uh, a lab launching soon at UB in media study that will focus on games, virtual reality, and community storytelling projects. The lab will be working with Gay Lesbian Youth Services, or GLIS, of Buffalo, the Albright Knox, and other community partners on projects in these areas. Stay tuned for the official launch and the website announcement coming soon. Um, and just one more sort of global comment about the Pala Light Lab. Pala Light Lab is a creative and critical space that fosters poetry, participation, and pedagogy through technology and equity. As a knowledge design, new media, and poetry lab, the Pala Light Lab investigates critical questions in cultural criticism, along with the networked arts and humanities. 
Utilizing a feminist and queer centered approach, we are interested in design anchored in the humanities and scholarship informed by transdisciplinary practices and technology. Pala Light Lab centers the question of equity at the forefront of our work, and we seek to creatively and critically engage new media in experimental ways that address pressing social issues and injustices. The Pala Light Lab is based out of the University of Buffalo Department of Media Study uh, and is funded by uh, the SUNY Diversity Faculty Fellowship. So um, for those of you who had a chance to see the exhibition um, or to listen to other presentations from either myself or my co-curator, Paul Venus, you'll know that um, the work that Pala Light Lab and that uh, Margaret and Cody are both doing very much intersects with the work that um, we're doing right now at the Albright Knox and especially through the exhibition Difference Machines, which is very much concerned about questions of technology and equity and social justice and community. So um, we are, are so thrilled to be able to sort of amplify and boost the work that is happening by our colleagues just across town over at Pala Light Lab at UB this evening and soon at Omatrix um, as well. Um, and so I'm going to uh, cede the floor over to um, Dr. Margaret Ree. After that, we'll hear our presentation from Dr. Cody Meir, and then we'll follow that up with a brief conversation between the three of us about, the, um, about their work and about the exhibition and open it up to any questions that you guys might have. So um, without further ado, uh, Margaret. Great. Thank you so much, Tina, for that wonderful introduction. Um, and again, thanks to everyone at um, Albright Knox, um, Tina, Stephanie, also Paul for the invitation and, um, you know, curating such an exciting exhibition. Um, I was able to visit um, last month and it's just really, um, you know, just such a dynamic um, exhibition and it's really exciting to be in conversation together. Um, so today I think I'm just going to, you know, go ahead, share a few, um, projects that I've been working on in the past and present on new media, gender, um, race, and poetry. And I think that's what the exhibition does so well and so dynamically with um, Tina and Paul's vision, right? If thinking about new media art um, at the intersections of gender and race and sexuality. And so I just really thank them for um, the interventions they're making in new media art. So I'll go ahead and just, yeah, share a few projects and really look forward to the conversation all together with Cody. All right, so um, I want to share these two quotes. Um, the first um, by Edward Hirsch, the poet in The Making of a Sonnet, a Norton Anthology. Quote, there must be something hardwired into its machinery, a heartbeat, a pulse that keeps it breathing, unquote. And the second by computer scientist Alan Turing, I could never write poetry, which he actually includes in his um, article um, on um, the conception of artificial intelligence in 1950. And um, we often think about technology and poetry being quite different or separated. But in fact, if we look at these two quotes, we see how intertwined they can be that in a lot of ways, the sonnet itself can maybe be thought about as a little machine. And as Alan Turing points out, that these questions around technology and AI and computer science can also um, intersect with poetry. Um, and it's really, I think, the, inter the intervention of the humanistic, right, when we're thinking about um, technology. So if you turn to the next slide, thank you, Tina. Um, that is really where my work resides at the intersection of poetry and technology. Um, I also just want to briefly point to Audre Lorde, um, Black lesbian poet warrior by, you know, her own definitions of the 1970s and 80s who have done really incredible work around intersectionality and poetry as well as um, theory. Um, and partly because Audre Lorde talks about poetry in this way that's, um, you know, almost like architecture, right? And as survival for many people who are marginalized. She also talks about the master's tools will never dismantle the master's house. And I think if we think about techne as um, technology, as a kind of tool, it's really exciting to turn back to um, feminist, queer, you know, women of color, artists and poets who are doing this kind of work. Um, Certainly, you know, the exhibition itself, I think, points to that with different queer artists like Zach Blass um, and other um, artists of color like Stephanie Dinkins who are doing this interventions, right, in new media art. 
So in my own work in poetry, I like to experiment um, on the page, thinking about coding, um, technology um, as really intersectional, right? So these are some um, code poems that are in the book that I wrote, Love Robot. Um, if you can turn the slide, Tina. Um, and this is another algorithm poem. So many of the poems which are narrative poems, but also include an algorithm. And this really kind of stems from some of the uh, research I was doing about race and robots, which I'll share a little bit more um, going forward. Um, here's another example. This is from a chatbot script. Um, that kind of rethinks what we can imagine in terms of human and machine um, relations. I definitely think of this book as a, you know, queer poetry book in a lot of ways, right? It's science fictional, but it's also this imagination of um, subversion, right? Of human and machine, um, you know, intimacies, right? And love and erotics. So um, in this poem, I was um, inspired, especially with the last part of it, if you look um, down and to the right, um, when I was programming um, a chatbot for a, a game I was making on Alan Turing um, back when I was in graduate school. So a lot of the work I do in med new media, you know, begins to get infused in poetry and vice versa, where the poetry also gets infused in a lot of my interests in new media art and theory. Um, and so another project I've been working on is my book manuscript, which is a scholarly study on race and robots um, and the Asian American body. And in large part, when I was a graduate student, um, I you know, was working on this um, dissertation, now turning into a monograph, but um, you know, as a poet, I wanted to find some reprieve, right? In thinking about these theories of race and robots. And so that's really where the poetry book stemmed from. Um, this current monograph um, now has been, you know, revised. It's currently under review at Duke University Press. Um, and, you know, it's a study about how Asian Americans and other racialized, um, you know, communities have been um, racialized in ways in terms of the human machine and um, animal analytic and how Asian Americans have oftentimes been racialized as machines throughout different time periods. So I look at the 19th century, um, 1940s through the contemporary moment, and then also contemporary, um, you know, examples such as science fiction films. This particular image is of Nan Jun Pak. Um, so I'll just touch briefly on this and his robotic artwork in 1960, K456. And so I also examined how Asian American ro uh, artists, not robots, but artists have used robots in ways to resist, right? Through um, aesthetics. Thank you, Tina. Um, so this is just an example of the different chapters. Um, as um, I just shared, it goes through um, different time periods. So it really begins in the 19th century, looking at the Industrial Revolution um, and how it intersects with Asian migration and um, in ways that racialization and racial formation worked in that period. Um, I then turn to the 1940s. I'm also looking at the um, representations of the atomic bomb and then what comes after the atomic bomb with different kinds of media migrations of the Hiroshima maidens, which were a group of women who came from Hiroshima for reconstructive surgery and some interesting discourses there. Um, as mentioned, I look at pretty extensively Nam Jun Pak um, and did a lot of research on him at the Smithsonian Art Museum. And um, other chapters cover different kinds of theories from queer feminist theory. I also look at the contemporary period and other examples of resistance, right, through poetry and cinema, as well as ways that some of these racializations are quite difficult, right, in regards to the robot. Um, so this is just a slide um, in terms of the Turing Test Tournament, which was a game that I worked on. Um, as mentioned, a lot of this research I work on um, connects to um, the different new media art projects that um, I've been engaged in as well. And so certainly the monograph that I'm finishing up now um, is informed by a lot of the different kinds of new media um, artwork I've been working on as well as in conversation with. 
Um, so I think lastly, or like, I think I'm sharing just some a few of my new media artworks at this last part. Um, and I'm really eager for the conversation um, after this um, with Tina and Cody. Um, this project is the Kimchi Poetry Machine, um, which was a project I worked on in 2014. Um, and it was this idea of what happens when we uh, respond to digital libraries and reimagine the poetry book in the future. And so instead of thinking of it as a, you know, a one dimension, like a flat screen, right? How can we think about GUI, um, a more graphical, you know, instead of a graphical user interface, right? Think of it as a tangible user interface. So I thought about a jar, I thought about kimchi, right? The Korean condiment. Um, and yeah, and sort of played around with that. So this jar programs different kinds of short poems by feminist and queer poets. Um, they're poems not written by me, but actually by others. Um, much of my new media artwork is um, invested in social practice and community-based work. So this is certainly one of them as well. Um, if you can turn, yeah. So if you wanna check out this project, you can um, have access to it at the Electronic Literature Collection, volume three, which also has many different kinds of projects. They have a yearly um, online exhibition or anthology type um, forum um, where one can get access to that. So um, I just want to briefly mention that project actually stemmed from a more analog project in which I was kind of working with, um, you know, people that came to my poetry readings and then writing poetry with them um, on, you know, crap paper and they would write lines of poetry and then I would collage them and then give them back. And so what happened was after a time, I had many different jars and then that became one of my first installations. Um, so this was like the kimchi poetry project. So this came before the kimchi poetry machine. But I do like sharing this project because as you can see, like it's very analog, it's very simple, but a lot of the same concepts are there, thinking about poetry and access um, in the jar, in the bowl in the front is like, there are um, pocket poems so people can just take poems with them that are, you know, excerpts from the poems from the jar. Um, over time, you know, being invited by different workshops and um, community centers or universities, it just became a really great way to kind of engage with people in writing poetry together. Um, I also like sharing this because I like thinking about new media as not only new media and technological, but also thinking about paper, right, as technology, right? Um, thinking about how jars can be technological and just really kind of um, making sure we take out um, static notions of technology. Um, and here is um, a terrible picture of me, but um, it kind of shows how the sort of more installation performative aspect of it is where I invite people to come and um, engage. So if you can turn the, um, yeah. So these are just other images of the jar and different demos I did over the years. Um, you can um, switch, Tina. Yeah, and this is a closer up image of, the poems that are in the poetry machine, and these are the poets that I invited. Yeah, and here's a close up, and the, these are placed in the jar. So when someone takes the poem from the poetry machine, the poem would emit audibly. So I should have some videos coming up too. So hopefully that'll help. Yeah, so here's a video of Misha Cardenas, a really wonderful trans new media artist um, that can kind of. I think demonstrate further what the jar does. Um, hopefully, does it play or? Okay, um, it might. It, it's okay. It might just be the PowerPoint, so I can just put those links online, no problem. But yeah, so here are some just you know demo videos. I'll put those in the chat. This is Celeste Maglan, also a really interesting artist from LA who helped me do some demos. So here are some other demos at different um, universities and spaces over the years. Um, some people really took some liberties and went really close. That was an <laughs> intentional, intended, right? But yeah, quite fun. Um, and 
you know, so this is a project that um, I just also have been working on um, and finished. It's a book manuscript, you know, as someone who primarily writes, it's been really interesting um, kind of looking back at something I made and writing into it. And what happened was after I worked on this project, um, I got asked to write, you know, different short articles on it or essays. And over time, um, a kind of poetry hybrid text kind of began to emerge. So this book is um, currently also under review at Duke University Press in a series called Writing Matters. Um, it's a series on uh, experimental scholarly uh, writing practices. Um, and so here are some examples of the um, essays included. It's actually a epistolary. So the idea is that each chapter is a letter to a reader in the future. So if you could turn, yeah. And then I think this is where the presentation will, will end and I'll share just briefly about this project and I think one more. Um, this is a long-term project I worked on also actually in San Francisco. Um, in the San Francisco jail and with women of color on digital storytelling. So that's also of interest of mine of really thinking about how marginalized communities can utilize technology and ways to um, represent themselves and their stories. And so this was a digital storytelling project um, on HIV AIDS um, created by women incarcerated in the San Francisco jail. So, um, and these are some images of the project. You can turn the page and, um, and I can share some links about this project. And I think it might be also of interest to folks, um, you know, working with and attending Albright Knox um, exhibits and community events, right? Just, it's an example of how the university um, and different institutions like museums can really come together in terms of community building. Um, and so the idea behind the project was really about how women who were incarcerated can obtain skills and they would also have the opportunity to be hired as research assistants if they wanted to work with the team. Um, and we we're working with the Department of Public Health as well. And this is Helen Hall, who was actually um, one of the digital storytellers um, who, upon release, came back and spoke to the UCSF um, Center for AIDS. Um, so I think there's a really powerful example of those in the community who can really take up leadership, right, and share their work and help lead these dialogues at these research centers. Um, and so a lot of my work really stems with, as I mentioned, social practice and community building um, and voices. And so this was an ELIT project I worked on with um, graduate students at the University of Wisconsin for their conference um, for the Midwest. And part of this was really thinking about how do we empower graduate students and really having a series of workshop prompts um, and creating our own kinds of slogans, right, that can really hold graduate students um, in their writing. And if you click on these different hearts, different kinds of links will show up. But I can, yeah, share a few of these in the chat. Um, and then I think this is the last one. And so, and this is what I'm currently working on, which is um, a project called Diversity Statement. And so I've been really increasingly interested in diversity statements only because I've been kind of tasked to help write, you know, one for my department and other institutions I've been working with. Um, but one organization I work with was the Electronic Literature Organization as their anti-racism -race, um, fellow. And what I did was a workshop based on thinking about these conversations of diversity, right? And just the importance of climate. So this was a workshop where people kind of gave their own um, thoughts about diversity, what it means, what does inclusion mean for the organization. And so from here, I am actually working on, you know, a chat bot to create um, and thinking about ways that a diversity statement doesn't have to be a written statement, but can be something multimodal or more kinetic um, and interactive. Wow, um, that was so rich. Um, 
I am just really struck um, by some of the through lines throughout your whole practice, um, one of which is thinking about making things that people might consider immaterial tangible. Um, starting with language, I love the idea of making language itself something concrete or just reminding people that you interact with language in a way that um, you know requires physically moving things around. Um, and this is something that we think about all the time when we work with, with um, you know, visual digital assets, when we work with digital art, right, is reminding people that uh, a, a digital file might be immaterial in some sense, but it's actually quite material in others, um, whether it's the way that it's stored on a piece of hardware or the way that it manifests through a piece of hardware that has scale and dimension and luminosity and all of that. Um, so I, I love that idea. Um, also the community focus, um, and actually you sort of beat me to it, but one of the things I wanted to put on the table um, for this conversation is the role of institutions in, in serving communities. Um, I think that's something that, you know, all of us who are interested in pushing forward a conversation about equity um, have been uh, thinking about a lot the past few years, right? Um, and one of the things I really love that you just emphasized there at the the end is um, the idea that people from the community themselves can take on leadership roles in organizations. I mean, one of the things that I think is um, incredibly valuable to think about is the kind of knowledge and wisdom that already resides in the community and that it's not so much a matter of an institution going outwards and disseminating its knowledge. It's a matter of having dialogue with community and understanding the value that our audience is already or the wisdom and the knowledge that you know they already have and that they bring into the conversation. Um, so um, yeah, I just really appreciated you putting that on the table. So, um, and, but we'll so much more to talk about. <laughs> Cody, um, I'm gonna um, queue up your slides here. I think, is this where you wanted to start or should I go one more? Um, I, Margaret, did you wanna talk about Paula Light Lab really quick before we get to, to the community stuff I'm gonna talk about? But I think Tina did a great introduction. Um, and yeah, I, I really appreciate your insights, Tina. And absolutely. So just the Apollo Light Lab that Cody and I collaborated on is really just about that, that within the institution of a university, how can we make it more inclusive and community minded? So Great. So and if people want to learn more about um, Apollo Light Lab, uh, we have a screen grab here of your your website up with a call for a, a new cohort. Um, so um, people can, I think that we linked to you from the event page for this talk. So if you were able to register and you're watching this talk right now, you presumably can find um, their website too, um, to read more about them and the work they're doing here. So yeah. okay, great. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that, yeah, this next slide is actually a picture of one of our meetings, like speaking of community, and I'm so glad that uh, Tina, you're kind of pointing us in that direction because that's really what I wanted to focus on in my remarks today. Um, what's on the screen right now is uh, Paula Light Lab really focused on uh, making artist community um, and making a cohort of artists, not just from UB or from Buffalo, but really nationally and internationally, bringing people together who are interested in new media art, interested in creating their own own sort of stories and experiences in new media and bring them together in a space where they can support each other, uh, especially since folks doing queer and feminist work um, that can sometimes be really isolating in a university setting. So this image is of, of one of our really fantastic meetings with our artist cohort in the past year. Um, and yeah, it was just a, a really wonderful community and I think got, helped a lot of us get through another pandemic year of education. So yeah, I think we could go to the next slide. Perfect. Um, and like I said, Tina, I'm really glad that you, you're pointing us to community. I, I was almost like, well, Tina already said what I wanted to say about community. I think we can we can go right to the Q and A. Um, but I, I've been thinking, uh, so my own work is with uh, queer and trans video games. Um, and often that involves looking at individual uh, video games and their stories. But I'm really, really passionate about um, and invested in community building as well. And, and for a few different reasons. Like the first is one that Tina already pointed to. And that's that institutionally, um, I'm very aware of working at a university that universities, even public ones like UB, have often been exclusionary places. They're places that are only there for the people who can afford to go there. Um, even when you get there, they can often be very exclusionary and elitist in sort of what they expect from you or what they expect 
expect you to know already. Um, and so I'm really interested in, um, in breaking down some of those walls, right? Not in a way that's like, oh, the university comes out to the community, but that, you know, there's those barriers aren't there at all to begin with, that it is much more of a dialogue and it's reciprocal community relationships. Because I'm really, uh, I think that we have so much wisdom and, and so many fantastic stories that we all have to share. And, um, and I think that universities aren't always necessarily the best places to do that. But, um, but anyway, so I'm very interested in, in community for those reasons. I'm interested in, for myself, um, you'll see a lot of the organizations that are on the screen here that are either existing partnerships with community organizations or ones that are sort of growing and being established right now. Um, my own individual story with digital media and especially with video games was one of video games kind of being a space for me as a queer person to um, explore my own identity and who I was, especially in where I was growing up was not um, a very sort of friendly space for that. It was not always safe for me to do that um, with the people around me in the actual world. So video games became a place where I could do that for myself. And, um, and I was so interested in part of why I still um, work with this and teach with this is that I think that games can do that for other people too. And often they've done that for, they're doing that for other people constantly. So I'm interested in it not just being sort of like our individual stories, but our community stories, like how we have used digital technologies, reappropriated them and hacked them and used them to create our own spaces um, that maybe weren't available to us all the time in the actual world. And finally, I'm interested in community. Oh, if I could have one more second on that slide, <laughs> uh, because, and I love the difference, uh, difference machines um, exhibition because it was, it drew attention to also the problems with community. I think a lot of our online experiences are also experiences of digital technologies and online spaces where it's not safe, where you have to be careful and protect yourself, right? Um, and, and protect your community. Um, so the uh, logos that you see on the screen here, um, I'll go into more detail about these on the coming slides, but um, working with gay lesbian youth services on some queer gaming events that I'll get more to in a moment, working with Buffalo Pride organization to potentially hold some like queer community gaming events um, that would just bring in anybody from the LGBTQ community who would be interested in playing some games together and having like a community night like that. Um, the Albright Knox game design classes uh, that ran in December um, and uh, were teaching youth how to get started with their own game design projects. Uh, Pride Center of Western New York, um, which might be getting involved with one of the game projects I'll get to. And then finally, I've also worked with the LGBTQ Video Game Archive, where I've worked with researching the history of queer and trans stories in games and what that representation has looked like. Um, okay, now we can go to the next slide. Um, so uh, the first sort of uh, community uh, collaboration, community building effort that I'm taking part in right now is working with Gay Lesbian Youth Services of Buffalo, uh, which is currently housed at St. Stephen's Bethlehem United Church of Christ, which is the image on the left there. Um, it's a very sort of, uh, the, the church itself is an open and affirming church, which means that it is one that is centered around queer and trans people, that queer and trans people are involved in the leadership, and that it is a space for LGBTQ people, not just to sort of be tolerated, but to be loved and supported in the fullness of our beings. Um, Inglis is currently housed there. And what we're planning right now, unfortunately, things have been kind of delayed because of the pandemic and uh, things having to go online repeatedly. Um, but what we're planning there are queer gaming events for youth where they would be able to come and join. For example, on the right, there's an image here of the uh, a queer logo of Dungeons and Dragons. So we would be doing like drop in gaming events where people could come and make their own characters and just do sort of like a one-off like Dungeons and Dragons session together or be able to play games like um, Among Us or Fortnite or you know other games that um, we can play easily without having a, a lot of technology on hand um, and uh, and so like that's one of the things that we're really uh, interested in and in continuing to build for uh, youth in the area. Uh, next slide please. 
Uh, a second initiative that got started in December um, 2021, and, and thanks so much to Stephanie and to Sam at Albright Knox for helping to organize this. Uh, there were some youth game design classes where so community youth could register for these and come just get started with the basics of making their own games. I, I loved this class so much and the students in it were so fantastic um, because it was just a great opportunity. And one of the things I hear so often at the college level from students is that they're like, oh, Oh, I'm just interested in getting involved with making my own games. I know that that's super complicated and really hard to do. So I'm hoping to like learn those basics, but you can do that so much earlier than college level, right? Like you can do that at elementary, middle and high school levels. You can do that without any educational training at all. There are ways that you can just jump in and start getting, um, getting going with making your own game projects. And the Albright Knox classes that ran in December, I thought were um, a really great opportunity to start building opportunities like that. The students did a fantastic job of, they mostly made their own analog games. Uh, so going back to sort of like the analog and the physical, the material um, technologies there. Um, but they were able to make their own games over the course of three weeks that then we got to play together and that they got to take home and play with their families. Um, and so that was a really great experience and I hope that they keep uh, making games in the future. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, one of the other projects that I've been working on with a team of folks um, is Trans Folks Walking. It's a video game that is dedicated to telling trans stories. Um, and trans stories there is very deliberately and intentionally plural because one of the things that my team and I have talked about a lot in making a game like this is the worry that when you make a game that's about trans people that then Sometimes people will approach that and be like, oh, well, this will tell me what the trans experience is like, like the trans experience, like there's one that cuts across like every different, you know, identity and community. But we wanted to make a game that would uh, create space for lots of different stories of what it's like to be trans in different contexts. And so people would be able to tell their own stories. And one of the things that sets this project apart and also makes it a little difficult, but also exciting, um, is that we're approaching it as a community storytelling project. So it's not just us writing stories internally um, and putting them into the game, we're working with community partners and trans community members um, to tell our stories in the game, right? So if uh, trans folks are interested in becoming a part of the team, if they have a story they would love to see in a game form, we would love to work with them. And they're currently working with a few uh, folks um, to those ends. So that does, um, that comes with its own sort of design challenges. Often game design is a, you know, it's limited to a small team that's working on something together. When you open that up and make it more of a community thing, um, it's it, it can grow very quickly. Um, but we're really excited to see kind of where that heads. Um, and let's go to the next slide, because I think the next ones are some screenshots of the couple levels we have so far. Level one has you playing as a trans student uh, who is studying for finals in the library at your university. And so it takes, uh, and as you're studying, you have to go and use the bathroom. And so you have to choose between binary restroom options, either a men's room or a women's room. Um, and the, the level, um, has players experience why that's a difficult choice to make, right? How you can go with the one that actually matches your identity, but then you might be misgendered, you might be um, harassed or attacked in the bathroom. You know, there are various sort of things that could happen if you go with the one that is matches your identity, or you go with the one that matches the gender you were assigned at birth, which is also um, full of its own sort of pitfalls, right? Like how that can feel like you're having to betray yourself, or that can still lead to people harassing you in the bathroom based on how you look. Um, and so the level has people just experiencing that, what it's like to be a trans student in an institutional space going to the bathroom and how even that basic choice can be a difficult one. Uh, next slide, please. As we've designed our levels, we've really, and I think that this is a really important question generally when approaching community and this community storytelling projects, it's the question of who is this for, right? Is this for, you know, a particular audience or community? Is it more general than that? 
And in designing Trans Folks Walking, we really wanted to make sure that first and foremost, this was a game for trans people. Like if, you know, cisgendered people come and play this game, wonderful. You know, I hope that it's a great experience and people learn from it, but this is not meant to be sort of an empathy game that teaches other people like, this is what it's like to be trans. It's meant to be a space of sort of recognition and storytelling primarily by and for trans people. Um, and so, uh, one of the design elements we've been working on is ways that these stories can be, uh, tell trans stories in ways that aren't just sort of uh, re-traumatizing for trans folks, right? So the experience of having to choose a bathroom can be a difficult one and can be a traumatic one for trans people. And um, one of the design elements for level one is that you sort of hear the whispers of other people around you, what they're saying about you. But as we were getting into the level, we were like, okay, but that could be re-traumatizing for trans folks, right? Like if you're, you know, these are things uh, trans folks are dealing with all the time. So do we really want to play a game then that is just like, oh, look, this is the thing that you're experiencing all the time. And now you get it in digital version. Um, so one of the solutions we came up with was making some of that content optional so that players can turn it on or off based on what they want to experience um, in the game. Uh, that chat bubble that you see on the screen right now, that sort of like blue circle with the three dots in it, um, that is something you can walk up and interact with, which will trigger a bit of narration and some of those like whispers of people around you. But it, you can turn that off. Uh, you don't have to interact with it at all if you don't want to. Um, and so we really wanted to have those options built into the game so that trans folks um, could sort of tailor it to what they wanted to get out of the experience. Uh, next slide, please. Level two is um, the story of a trans woman who's going back to the church that she grew up in um, and sort of reliving some of the memories of being in that religious space growing up, um, some of the memories there, good and bad. Um, and we're working in particular with um, a trans community member here in Buffalo, a trans elder who has um, both uh, provided some of the narrative for the level and is also going to be doing some of the voice acting for the level. So that's been really exciting um, for us uh, to work with uh, her. Um, yeah, I think we can probably go to the next slide. Um, and another sort of ongoing project that is community based in a different way is a project that this is a grant funded research project. It's a collaboration between UB, Michigan State, uh, Washington University of St. Louis and the US Air Force Academy and other community partners. It's a research project uh, called Creativity in the Time of COVID-19 that is designed to look at what forms creativity has taken during the pandemic. So I think like commonly we're all kind of aware of like the news stories and maybe even our own personal practices, like how we might have tried new things during the pandemic, like baking or painting or drawing or, you know, a, a bunch of different possible things there. Um, but this research project is meant to take a look at that and to see what different creative forms people were looking to in the pandemic and using to process their experiences of the pandemic. If you're interested in participating in that, in, in submitting your own experience, experiences. And again, that can be any art form, uh, a traditional art form, or just something like baking or gardening or crafting, anything that is, you know, involves some form of creative expression absolutely counts for this. If you're interested in that, there's the link, uh, there's a link on the slide here, and I'll post that in the chat as well, that takes you to a brief survey where you can share your experiences. And, and one of the biggest goals of this project is really to connect with people who are doing, um, just everyday experiences of art, right? So if you don't consider yourself an artist, you're actually exactly the person that we would love to connect with in this study. So um, yeah, uh, I think we can go to next slide. Um, and lastly, I'll just do a quick plug for, um, as Tina had mentioned, um, a new lab that's getting started in media study and will be sort of live soon um, is the Omatrix Gaming Lab and Studio. Um, it's going to be a lab that's focused on games, virtual reality, and community storytelling projects like Trans Folks Walking and others. Um, it'll continue some of the other things that I've mentioned, like the youth gaming events and the game design classes with Albright Knox and some other initiatives um, and plenty more to come. But uh, we do have a, a an email up for that uh, in case you're interested and would like to know more and then the website will be going up soon um but yeah thanks so much for for listening to me talk about some of the current projects and stuff i'm looking forward to the discussion thank you uh so much cody it's so exciting to learn about all the stuff that you 
you're doing too. I mean, obviously there's so many uh, moments of, of dialogue and conversation between the work that you're doing and also the work that Margaret's doing and some of the works that are on exhibition in the show. Um, I don't want to talk too much about specific works in the exhibition because I don't have those slides here and you know, not everyone will have seen the exhibition. Um, <clears throat> but obviously I'm thinking of works like Danielle Brathwaite Shirley's um, experience, you know, we are here because of those who are not, which is an interactive online game um, that is about Black trans experience. And now I'm thinking about how I have to make that plural, Black trans experiences. Um, and it's really, you know, what you've just said has really helped me appreciate the importance of what Danielle did, where uh, the very first step of encountering that game is where you uh, have to identify yourself, you know, whether you identify as somebody who is Black and trans or as somebody who's trans or someone who's cisgendered. And the reason I, I, I mentioned that, right, is, is uh, you know, your sensitivity to this question of re-traumatizing people and, and thinking about who your audience is, right? Are you, are you making a game that is for trans people? Or are you making a game that is for cisgendered people to, you know, as you said, like sort of like an empathy game? Um, and so one of the nice things about Danielle's game is that actually it can be for anybody, that it, it understands immediately that it needs to ask, well, who are you, the audience sitting in front of this game? And then depending on that answer, it, you know, the game, the gameplay changes. Um, so anyway, so I encourage people to spend some time on the Difference Machines uh, webpage on the Albert Knox website to encounter more of these experiences. We even have links so that you can go play some of these digital games online for yourself, which is really exciting. Um, as a kind of global comment, I just wanted to um, sort of underscore a major thread here that I think is really worth um, you know, uh, highlighting for our audiences, which is that, um, you know, we're really talking here about the power and the potential of digital technology, um, not only for um, artistic reasons or creative reasons, but also for community building. Um, and that, you know, so much of your projects, it's about interactivity, it's about um, participation, it's about working collaboratively. And this was precisely uh, why people were so excited about working um, with digital tools and particularly with early versions of networked programs um, going back to the 1980s, where even before the emergence of the World Wide Web, there were early internet-based networks that were designed specifically for artists um, who, you know, use them in order to be able to create artistic projects that were really collaborations between people. Um, and, you know, also thinking, you know, not only about using the internet, but also using new global telecommunication systems of the satellite networks um, to try to create these sort of participatory things. And so um, this, this idea of collaboration, participatory, the participation um, and interactivity has always sort of been one of the most exciting things about digital technology that you know people have been drawn to. And to bring that back to this question of community, I'm, I'm you know thinking about uh, the way in which um, you know the people who are empowered by digital tools. It's not simply other artists to create together, you're also empowering audience members potentially through those digital tools who no longer are audience members. They're now actually um, collaborators or co-producers in some Im important way. Um, or that there's a kind of ethos that bleeds over, right? We've gone from artists collaborating with each other to, um, you know, viewers or audiences actually being empowered to themselves become creators and how that sort of continues the promise of digital technology. Um, I did want to, um, you know, ask both of you um, uh, about something, and it's a, a very sort of high level question, but about something that I chew over all the time, which is that I constantly come up against this idea that somehow technology is neutral or that technology is apolitical. And Margaret, I'm really excited by your forthcoming book project, just you know, going back and looking at you know, the history, for example, of, of robots and the relationship between Asian identity, Asian American identity, and the idea of the robot to say, you know, when we talk about, you know, these technologies like the robot, for example, we're, there's always race and gender actually that's in those conversations, right? That we imagine that robots might be these neutral figures, but even if you go back to like Metropolis, for example, where like this robot future, you know, the robot figure from the future is like already imagined as being gendered and being a woman, um, that we, we can't really escape these things. So, um, 
I don't know if it's like a particular question, but I would just love to hear from both of you about your own experience, maybe your own path to discovery. Like, have you always understood that technology in some way is tied to these things because of your own experience? Like I know Katie, uh, Co sorry, Cody, you talking about, um, about gaming and, you know, the way that you found community through gaming, um, you know, so I wonder for you if it was always tied into these things or if this was sort of a discovery that you had at some point, or maybe what, if that's a weird question, then maybe, um, you know, what you would want people to understand um, about technology and its relationship to identity, which is essentially, you know, that's the subtitle of our show, right? Technology and identity in contemporary art. Um, yeah, thank you so much for that, Tina. I think that that sounds like all, yeah, yes to all of the things that you were just <laughs> talking about. Um, I think that, I mean, for me, it was technology has always been, uh, in my own experience, it's always been political, like even thinking back to like, and this is just in terms of my experience with video games, right? Like, I remember growing up and always being really jealous of all the people who had the gaming consoles because my family couldn't afford them, right? Uh, like that in and of itself is a political thing, right? Um, and not even getting into what happens within the game and where certain people are, you know, welcome or not welcome or or just not even considered in the design of a game, right? So like, but I, I didn't, I guess, always think of it in those terms. It wasn't until I think I got a little older and um, <laughs> learned from a lot of amazing uh, queer feminist um, and critical race sort of studies and, and, and takes on technology where like the thing that I had always kind of known now had a vocabulary to talk about it, right? Which is why I think those sorts of studies are, are so important and crucial. Um, if I had to sort of say a takeaway about identity and technology is I think like at best technology, uh, technology is at its best in terms of identity and community, I think when it becomes something that is something we can hack and tailor and sort of uh, reuse or repurpose, you know, to the, uh, you know, to the actual um, ends of our, our own communities, right? Um, I think that that's where we have some actual like sort of liberatory potential to technologies. I think at its worst, it's a technology that wants you to think that it's apolitical, right? That wants you to think that, um, yeah, just, just don't mind what's going on underneath the surface, right? Like that's, just don't worry about it. It's all fine, right? That's I think where technology is, is its most dangerous and also it's most harmful to people from marginalized communities. Um, Margaret, did you have thoughts about this? Sure, yeah, just to build on that, and this is a really great question, um, Tina, thank you. And I mean, I guess just briefly, I can share like my own journey to like thinking about technology in these different ways. Um, you know, it was certainly about media, you know, um, looking at media, you know, as a young person of color, an Asian American young woman or a queer person, like, really seeing representations matter, right? Like it's so drastically poignant when you first see someone that actually represents your culture, right? Like I can remember seeing Margaret Cho in All American Girl that, you know, this first sitcom in the 1990s um, where relatively there are no representations of Asian Americans, right? So my background, you know, prior to graduate school, I worked as a journalist. So I worked at this magazine called Yoke Magazine in Los Angeles, which was the first um, Asian American entertainment magazine that had a pretty long run at that time, about like a good 10 years. Um, and then I worked as an editor at Backstage, which was this actor's trade newspaper, which still is running now. It was a sister publication to The Hollywood Reporter. So um, as someone who worked in entertainment and who was like a journalist, um, certainly getting um, a close look at how race and gender and sexuality and all these identities were happening on the representational level. Um, and then as an editor at that time, um, I was the online editor for the website. Um, seeing the digital revolution really change what it meant to work at a publication. Um, by the time I went to graduate school in the like early, early um, prior, like in, you know, early 2000s, um, I was already questioning technology, you know? I was always thinking about like mass media, but then I was like, whoa, this is, a, a lot of this is about technology and new media and we're seeing this, um, you know? And I went to Berkeley and so, you know, there I took classes with like Ken Goldberg, right? On new media art and learned about robots, right? That really just kind of 
made these really um, amazing connections and these kind of, I don't know, clicks, I guess, right, in terms of what I've been thinking about representation and um, race and technology. And so I think um, certainly, you know, during that time, um, you know, Lisa Nakamura had been, you know, starting to publish and other theorists around race and technology. And so there became a more growing movement of, right, theory. Um, and so I think that definitely shaped some of the, you know, intellectual questions that I was having. But I think as someone also very interested in access, you know, um, as you both, both point to, um, you know, community becomes so important because, you know, we don't want to do all this work, this theoretical work without seeing it in practice, right? Like, how do we make technology accessible and not only that how do we change it you know in ways you know right and really honoring community knowledge so um you know for me the exhibition is really exciting I mean thinking of S Stephanie Dickens's work you know like oh my goodness like what yeah what she's doing with robots and race is so exciting and and you know uh, yeah, like new media artists who are really re like reinventing and remaking what we can understand as technology um, is I think we're in a really great moment right now. So um, just to sort of um, follow up on that real quickly, one more question that I have for you guys before we wrap up is, um, you know, the role of art in these conversations, right? So another thing that we sort of came up against while we were organizing this exhibition, um, you know, as you pointed out, there are many fantastic scholars who've been doing a lot of work, also journalists who have been doing a lot of work uh, to sort of interrogate or examine the really thorny and complicated relationship between, for example, technology and the politics of visibility, right? Then as Cody touched on, like the way that technologies are allowing communities to represent themselves, to tell their stories, to find community, um, but on the other hand, uh, are also finding that those technologies are being weaponized against them or that those technologies are making them vulnerable um, to uh, forms of abuse in new ways or even just are like propagating stereotypes, right? I mean, so um, <clears throat> these conversations I think have been happening and um, in sort of a, a more and more public way. If you look at all of the books that have been published and the articles that have been written recently, there was even this fantastic documentary, Coded Bias, which came out in 2020, which we also showed as part of the public programming for this exhibition. And if anyone's interested in all of these resources, by the way, on our website, we have a great list of some of the books that we've been written, um, including ones by Lisa Nakamura that Margaret was just mentioning. Um, so you can go and sort of um, give yourself a, you'll have your reading list for the rest of the year set out for you. <laughs> um, uh, so, you know, these conversations have been happening, but for, for Paul, my co-curator and I, you know, we thought it was really important to emphasize that artists have had a lot to say about this topic too, um, that artists have um, been sort of at the forefront of these conversations actually since the 1990s. And um, the value of, of artists in contributing to these conversations. So um, I wanted to ask both of you, since both of you are, you know, scholars who are very immersed in, in theory, but also are, are practitioners, are also working artists. I'm just curious um, if you could say anything about, you know, what you think the value of art is in these conversations or the, the value of art um, in sort of framing or negotiating emerging technologies. Yeah, um, <laughs> that's a really big and it's such an important question. Um, I can try, you know, try to begin answering it, but I would love to like also hear from you, Tina, because I feel like what you and Paul have done is just so um, exciting and really important. Um, I mean, I I just can't agree more. I think art is so essential to these conversations. Artists have definitely been at the forefront of, you um, rethinking technologies and new media, right? So um, if I turn back to like Nam Joon Pak and the work he did, you know, not only about robots, but the porta pack and different ways that him and other, you know, um, artists have rethought technology and reimagined, um, they provide such an intervention in a way that I don't, you know, and I don't want to, you know, point to time or speed that that's something that we want to all adhere to, but I think there's something where artists can do much more immediately than theorists can do, right? Theory, publishing theory takes a long time, and it might not even reach 
the communities that we want to reach. And artists have this very, I think, impactful way of really reaching audiences and really connecting and making those interventions. So, um, and I think especially with, you know, new media art, I mean, artists in working in new media are certainly um, creating theory and engaged with theory in ways that perhaps I wouldn't know, I wouldn't necessarily say perhaps like, artists and other mediums are not, but I think certainly new media artists are always, I think, making these cybernetic interventions and pointing out these ways that technologies um, can be utilized in different ways, right? So um, yeah, I mean, I'm, you know, I'm just thinking about like Rhizome as an organization and different new media art or, you know, ways that artists have just made such important interventions, so. Yeah, no, I, I um, likewise, I couldn't agree more with you. Um, I think you raised some really excellent points. And, and one of them, that last one right there, right, which is that artists aren't just illustrating theories, right? They're not just illustrating the work that's been done by scholars in the humanities or by journalists to point out, oh, technology is bad. They're actually developing, right, new frameworks, new critical frameworks. And um, another point that you made, which I think is so important, which is that they're, they're bringing these issues to an audience in a way that is uh, really visceral, is really tangible. Like one of the works, you know, I usually talk about in my tours of the exhibition is this giant work by Hassan Alahi, which is, uh, you know, a composite of over 32,000 digital photos. And I don't have time to say more about the work, but, you know, one thing I like to ask people is, why is this thing so big? You know, it's 26 feet tall and 15 feet wide. And it's precisely because what Allahi is trying to do is to help make uh, sort of intelligible the scale of digital surveillance and the scale of these databases that we cannot imagine. Like literally we cannot imagine, right? How do you imagine what a database looks like? And when you encounter this thing that is overwhelming, like physically overwhelming and towering over you, right? It helps make concrete uh, something that I think is, or, you know, that adds something um, to the conversation, right? To compare to like a sentence in the New York Times talking about how big these databases are. Um, okay, Cody, I'm going to give you a, a shot at answering that in case you have anything else you want to add. I mean, I, I completely agree with you and Margaret. I think that like um, my own thinking about like the role of art and all this is like, I think that in theory crafting is a word I'm gonna use here. It has a different sort of meaning in game spaces where it's like, uh, I don't know, it's it's like a mathematical practice. Uh, but like, I think that art is its own, it's its own version of like crafting and creating theory, right? It's its own version of visioning a future that is not merely abstract, but it is visceral, it's felt, right? That a story, a concept can be communicated communicated in a very meaningful and felt and affective way that I think theory can't like like scholarly academic writing doesn't always do justice to right um and I was really glad earlier too like and this goes back a you know a couple questions but you brought up Danielle Braithwaite uh, Shirley's work because I think that there's like a really core sort of uh concept that comes through in that game that I think is so crucial and that's it's a it's a, I think, an important sort of uh, maybe corrective critique or response to like a community is something we often feel very fuzzy about, right? Um, and that's really great. Like community can do good things, but community also is recognizing and respecting boundaries sometimes too. It's recognizing like not everything is for you, right? Like there might be things that are for a particular community. And if you are not part of that community, then it might not necessarily be something that is for your consumption or for your access, right? And I think that that is something that, you know, as much as that game is absolutely everyone can play it, it also communicates like, but there's some stuff here that it's for trans people or it's for black trans people, right? And it creates a space for those particular people. And I think that that's, that's something that as art, it communicates that sort of concept in a very felt way, in a way that I think makes more sense even maybe than an academic discussion of it might. Yeah, that was such a um, such a great point, right? Um, I couldn't agree more. Um, so we did have some questions come in in the Q and A. So um, the one that I definitely want to pitch to you guys. Um, and I'm going to try to go back through my slides really quickly, is about the origin of the name of Pale Light Lab. And actually, I'm going to piggy, piggyback on that because I wanted to ask you about the logo. Um, since we're all into art here, 
um, if you could just tell us a little more about the origin of the name. And then I also want to know about the logo. Sure, I can um, share a bit of more about the name um, and, and logo. I'm sure um, Cody can add to. Um, so Paula, so, you know, initially some of the origin of the lab started as a research collective. So I received a grant as a faculty member um, to, you know, create um, some spaces on campus. And so I chose to do a research, kind of a research collaboratory. Um, and invited Cody because Cody was doing really exciting work. Um, so we started quite small, about five people, and then we decided to name it. And what I thought of at that time was Pala. Um, it's like, it sounds like Padang in Korean, which is blue. And I've been obsessed with blue lights because I've been writing up lot of blue lights. And so that's kind of like the translation of that. So it's kind of obscure. It comes from a Korean word. Um, and then that's when we decided to expand out. And then we had all these people who wanted to join us in this um, in thinking about queer and feminist new media. And then the logo, we went through many different iterations of that. Um, but, you know, thankfully, uh, Blair Johnson, who's one of our RAs, awesome grad student in poetics, her and her partner helped create this logo and we wanted something kind of organic and technological too. Um, Cody, did you want to speak more on the logo? Um, yeah, I, I mean, I think what you just said at the end there too, Margaret, is a, a good um, way to put like what we wanted to get out of the logo, right? Like something that communicated new media, digital technology, but in a way that, um, uh, that uh, it had more sort of it connected to sort of the organic it was very material but then it was also it was natural it was flowery it was we often i mean we talked in the lab too about like softness too right about like of community and, and feeling of um and so like we we um and we had talked too about like what colors we wanted in the lab right like we wanted to have some like not like pastel colors but to have like some like lighter fun inviting colors and i think that the logo really communicates that well um and we did we went through some iterations but what blair and her partner came up with was just we knew the second we saw it was like yep this is the one i'm just laughing because we had such intense um conversations about color we we're just like oh my god <laughs> like, so yeah no, but I mean, you're, you know, these conversations are touching on some of the most important questions we can ask ourselves about technology, right? Like the degree to which technology is actually something that stands apart or outside of culture or that is opposed to the organic and the biological, right? And there's lots of work that's been done about the way that actually these terms are all like rhizomatically intertwined and you can't really separate them out. Um, but, but, you know, um, and, and thinking about like the history of how we came to think of technology as something sort of different or as something as inorganic. Um, so actually there's another question from the audience about a paper being technology. And so Margaret, um, you know, the, the question is basically this person is just saying that they're very intrigued about this comment that you made that paper itself is a kind of technology. So I wonder if you wanna um, address that. Sure, yeah, yeah, that's a great question. Um, and it's something I'm still thinking through. Um, but, you know, I think it's pretty useful and I think it really builds on a lot of the um, different points that were raised in our conversation already, like, like what can, um, you know, what are the possibilities of technology, right? And like, I think seeing technology as malleable and also um, historically, you know, at one point paper was technological, like was new media, right? And so um, in a lot of ways, um, I like to think about how the book itself isn't just, um, you know, text or print or book, but is also a, a real mixture, right, of tech technology, digital print, but also paper. Um, and so I think that's what I mean by paper as technology. I like to just point out that um, not all, um, if we're if we're thinking about access, you know, not all people might have um, computer skills, right? Like I, I worked with a lot of women who had no computer skills, you know, who could not turn, turn on the monitor. And so what happens there? How can we actually translate some of the access that we want into other kinds of forms and technologies too, to make that happen? Like, could we do that in a collage and then make that digitized? Like, so I think kind of thinking a bit expansively about technology um, might also help us think about access in different ways. 
I, I love that point. And it's reminding me also of what um, Cody was saying about the game design lab that uh, they were working on, you know, at the Albright Knox. And I was just so, so excited that that was a program that we were able to host and to work on with you. Um, so as you said, many thanks to my partners in the education department for facilitating that. But, you know, the fact that we were able to welcome teens into our space and to give them sort of practice and hands-on experience of making games. But as you point out, most of those games are, they were analog, right? And so I think, um, you know, the, the implication there is that, you know, uh, sort of games as a technology, it transcends uh, the sort of the specific digital devices, you know, that we should be thinking about, you know, games as themselves structures, um, as formats, right, that can manifest in different ways. And Margaret, you know, as you're saying that technology itself, like the technology of writing, for example, right, it's not just about zeros and ones, right? It's these other ways and thinking about how meaning is communicated and conveyed through form, which is um, what media theory is about, but also what art is about, actually. <laughs> so um, thank you guys so um, much. Thank you to our audience members for all of your fantastic questions. I think I should probably wrap it up now. I feel like we could keep doing this all night. <laughs> and the great thing is, is that you guys, um, I know right now you're out of town for, for the, you know, this part of your, your break in between um, semesters, but you're coming back um, to Buffalo and hopefully the Omicron surge will abate and we will be able to, to convene um, in real life again. Um, although, you know, continuing the conversation that we've just been having the past few minutes, right, these distinctions between analog and digital, physical and virtual, Right. I think that in this moment right now, we're actually understanding more and more how everything is sort of hybrid. Right. And that these interactions that we're having online are, in fact, real life and are just as meaningful um, as those that we might have face to face. But um, I don't know. I just personally like to be able to share a glass of wine with somebody, but um, that'll be that'll be for the future. Um, so again, thank you to everyone um, this evening for joining us for this conversation. Thank you so much, Margaret and Cody, both for sharing the work that you guys are doing um, individually and also as part of Pale Light Lab and Omatrix. I'm so excited um, and and can't wait to see um, your future projects as they continue to develop. Um, and uh, thank you so much for um, being part of the conversation around this exhibition, Difference Machines, Technology and Identity in Contemporary Art, um, and, and helping us sort of tie it, uh, or maybe not tie it down, open it up, I was going to say, open it up to a broader world of artistic practices um, and ideas, while also sort of tying it down to the, the local community work that can be done, um, you know, both through the Albright Knox and also with other um, organizations locally here in Buffalo. So thank you guys so much for all the work that you do. And everyone, I hope you have a great evening. Um, and we we will see you hopefully next week for our last online public program for the exhibition Difference Machines, which will be a Zoom-based audiovisual performance by the Black Sound artists, as they are known, um, Mendy and Keith Obadike, so, um, who are also artists in the exhibition. So I really hope that everyone joins us for that. It's free. You can register for the Zoom link through our website, albrightknox.org. Um, and hopefully, Margaret and Cody, you guys will be able to, to Zoom into that too. <laughs> All right, everybody, have a great night. Thank you so much, Tina. Thank you so much. Thanks, everyone, for coming.